Hey, this is Andrew, and I'm here to bring you a video about how to play Keyforge. And, uh, you know, maybe you've seen this game floating around, uh, you've heard about it, and you're just wondering, uh, you know, how, how could I get started? What's it all about? Uh, this video is going to walk you through what the game is about, how, how it works at a very basic level, um, the, the very small set of rules that you need to know to get started. And then uh, my brother-in-law Mark and I have a video where we walk through playing a game so, so we can demonstrate for you how that works uh, from start to finish. And then I'll close out by discussing a few more advanced concepts that you need to know uh, in the long run, as well as talking about how to actually buy in. If you want to get started, what do you need to go buy? And how can you start uh, getting involved in playing with other people? So without further ado, um, Keyforge is a unique deck game. It's the world's first unique deck game. And what that means, uh, if you've played other games like Magic the Gathering or Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh! or even some of the Fantasy Flight games, other games like Netrunner or uh, L5R or Th Game of Thrones. Uh, in those games, you either collect through randomly opening booster packs or through, uh, with living card games, opening uh, <clears throat> preset packages of cards. Uh, you get a collection of cards, and from that collection of cards, you build a deck that you'll show up and play with. Uh, but with Keyforge, it doesn't work that way. You don't build a deck. Instead, you get a deck. You open up a box that looks like the one on the right. It has a 37-card deck. One of those cards is basically the, the list of cards, uh, and the other 36 are what you'll actually use to play the game. Um, you can't swap the cards in or out. You play with what you open. You can go get another deck, but you can't change a deck. It is a two-player game. Uh, some people have played around with some interesting multiplayer variants, but in the officially supported context, it's, it's, it's a two-player game. It takes about 15 to 45 minutes to play out a game, just depending on how things go and how quickly people are playing. Uh, the contents of a deck are generated by an algorithm. Um, that algorithm is pseudo-random, which means that uh, it, it does randomly choose what cards go in, but it's within certain constraints. Um, there are different levels of rarity, so common cards are much more likely to show up in your deck than rare cards, for example. And additionally, uh, there are some extra rules that they put in place to prevent uh, weird things that they think wouldn't be good for the game, and also to prevent there ever being two of the same deck printed. Um, Keyforge is in a new intellectual property lore setting. Uh, it's not taking from, you know, it's not in Warhammer or Pokemon or, or anything like that. It's just brand new, a brand new setting, and uh, it, they do borrow from some literary references here and there, but it really is a, a new setting. And I'm not going to go really deep into that because that's really not what this video is about, but it, just so you know, it's it's not in any setting that you're already familiar with. Um, all right, the point of the game, the way you win, is by forging three keys. Um, at the start of the game, you have zero keys, and you, you need to get to three. At the point you've gotten to three, you win. A uh, key, generally speaking, costs six amber, to forge and you play and use the cards from your deck in order to gain amber. Uh, in order to play, each player needs their own deck. Uh, each player would shuffle their cards. You use any random means to decide who's the first player. The first player draws seven cards. The second player draws six cards. The first player can choose to mulligan, uh, which would mean they put their cards back in their deck, reshuffle, draw six new cards. Then the second player can choose to mulligan if they want. They would put
put their cards back in their deck, reshuffle, draw five cards. So in each case, one fewer. Um, and the first player has the handicap that on their first turn, they can only play one card. Generally speaking, you, you can play more than one card, but uh, on the first turn of the game, only one card may be played. So each turn, you're going to go through a set of five steps, and then it'll become the other player's turn. So the first step of every turn is forge a key. Um, so in most circumstances, this means you'll check to see, do I have six amber? If I have six amber, I'm going to forge a key. I pay that six amber, turn one of the keys forge side up. That's it. Um, if you have 12 amber, you don't get to forge a second key. There, are, It's possible that there are effects in the game that might change the cost of a key, but let's not worry about that for now. Let's assume you're going to be paying six. So if you have six amber, you forge a key. Then you move on to step two. The step two, you choose a house. Now, your deck is going to have three out of seven houses. And for each of those three houses, you're going to have 12 cards that make up altogether a 36 card deck. So assuming on a normal turn, you're going to have six cards in your hand at the start of the turn. Um, there's a decent chance you might have two cards from each of those houses. Possible you'll have more cards from one house. It's even possible that you'll only have one house in your hand. But uh, in any case, each turn you can choose one of the three houses that's listed on your deck. Uh, and that's going to be your active house for the turn. For that turn, you'll be able to play and use and discard cards of that house, but not cards of other houses. Uh, so you choose a house at the beginning of the turn, that uh, that house is active for the whole turn. Um, I put a note here, you, you can at that point also choose to return your archives to your hand. We'll worry about that later, but just know that does happen uh, immediately after you choose a house. In step three, this is where the main meat of the game happens. Step three is when you play, discard, and use your cards. You can do that in any order, generally. And uh, But you're limited to only playing, discarding, and using cards that are of the house that you chose in, uh, in step two. So in this example, um, I have, this is a Logos card. Um, if I chose Logos as my house this turn, then then I could you know play this card or use it, etc. Um, at in step four, once you've en once you decide to end step three, you go to step four. You take any cards that are exhausted, which means they're on their side, and you make them ready. Um, this is a pretty common nowadays mechanic in games to turn cards on their side when they're uh, when they've been used. Um, in this case, again, the word we use is exhausted. Um, and then turn them right side up to indicate when they are, uh, they're ready to go again. So uh, at the end of your turn, any card, any of your cards that were exhausted become ready. And then you go on to step five, which is draw cards until you have six. That's the, the default hand size. There's some cards that might grow or shrink your hand size. Uh, in which case you you know you would draw up to whatever your hand size is, but by default it's going to be six. All right, so let's dig into step three a little more. I mentioned that's where the meat of the game is going to occur. Step three is when you can play, discard, and use cards of your active house. So uh, there are four types of cards. Um, I'll walk through each of them. The first and I suppose simplest is an action. Uh, when you play an action card, you're going to first gain any amber bonus that is shown in the upper left corner. Uh, it's very common for this to be zero or one, but there are a few cards that have more, uh, two, three, or four. Um, so when you play an action card, if it has an amber bonus, the first thing you do is get that bonus. Then you obey the play instruction. The, the play ability is what it's called and then you discard it. It goes into your discard pile. And that's it. Um, the variation comes in, you know, what these play instructions are. But the, the formula is simple. When you play an action card, if it shows amber, you gain that amber, you do what it says, and then you discard it. Uh, artifacts are a little different. Artifacts 
tend to stay on the board. Um, when you play an artifact, it enters play exhausted, so turned on its side like this. If it has amber printed in the corner, this, this one doesn't, but if it has amber printed in the corner, you're going to gain that amber into your amber pool. And if it has a playability, you're going to do what the playability says. At the end of your, well, in step four, this would become ready, but not until we get to step four. So it'll stay exhausted uh, until, until we end step three, unless some other effect causes it to become ready. Uh, creatures work similarly to artifacts, but creatures enter into what's called a battle line. So with artifacts, uh, it doesn't matter what order they're in, they're just there and they're either exhausted or ready. But with creatures, they, they go in this battle line, it's a sp specific order. Um, and you can't just change the order around. Um, cards are stuck in the order that they came out. Uh, in this top example, Dodger and Titan Mechanic are both on a flank. <clears throat> Dodger's on the left flank, Titan Mechanic's on the right flank. Urchin is not on a flank. Uh, when I add a new, when I play a creature, um, I need to add it to the battle line on either flank. So in this case, Big Twig could either go to the left of Dodger or to the right of Titan Mechanic. And in this example, I've chosen to place Big Twig to the right of Titan Mechanic. Big Twig enters play exhausted. If there were any amber printed, I would gain it, any amber bonus. And if the card has a play ability, then you would obey it at, at that time. Um, the, the final, the fourth type of card is an upgrade. And when you play an upgrade, it attaches to a creature. Uh, if you don't have any creatures, uh, you would have to attach it to an opponent's creature. And in fact, uh, even if you do have creatures, as long as they have creatures, you could attach an upgrade to their creature. Um, you usually wouldn't want to, but you, you absolutely can. Uh, and so when you, so when you play it, the upgrade, you attach it to a creature and it modifies the creature in some way. Like for example, this gives the creature an ability called assault Two. Don't worry about that for now, but it, it gives the creature that ability. Um, it also has an amber bonus, which you get when you play it. If it has a play ability, you obey that. Uh, when a creature leaves play, the upgrade goes in the discard pile. Um, and there are ways uh, for everything to leave play. An upgrade will leave play when the creature it's attached to leaves play. Um, artifacts typically don't leave play unless something says to, to take them out which can certainly happen, uh, and creatures tend to uh, leave play due to fighting, but we'll, we'll cover that. Uh, so that's how you play a card. Now, what about using cards? Well, during step three, you can use any cards that are of your active house. So if I've chosen Logos as my active house, then I can use Logos cards that I control. Um, they must be ready in order to use them. And uh, there are two ways to use cards that are um, only true of creatures, and then I'll, there are a couple others that can also be true of artifacts, and I'll cover those as well. So the first one is that you can use a creature to reap. <clears throat> Reaping means you gain an amber. So anytime you use a card, it becomes exhausted. So it starts ready, you use it, it becomes exhausted. And uh, in the case that we decide to reap, we exhaust the creature and we gain an amber. Uh, and the creature is now exhausted. Again, when we end step three and move on to step four, then it would become ready again. And the second way that you can use, uh, that you can always use a creature is to fight. Um, when a creature fights, it picks a target, uh, one of your opponent's creatures, to, to fight against, to attack. And the, uh, your creature that's attacking and the enemy creature that is being attacked, they each do damage to the other equal to their power level. So if you look on this card down here, it has power level 3. This card has power level 2. So the Niphilate, which has power level 3, deals 3 damage to the Research Smoko. The Research Smoko, which has power level 2, does 2 damage 
to the Niffle Ape. Um, at that point, we would see that the Research Smoko has two power but three damage. And uh, because its damage is equal to or greater than its power, it would become it would be destroyed. The Niffle Ape, on the other hand, it exhausted, it dealt three damage, it took two damage. Uh, its damage is not equal to its power. That damage will stay on it uh, unless something heals it until it's destroyed. Um, but for now, it just has two damage, so it's fine. It stays exhausted, and in step four, it would become ready again. Um, one important thing that, that people seem to get confused about a lot is that if next turn I use Niflape to fight again, it'll still do three damage. It'll still do damage equal to its power, even though you might say, oh, well, it only has one health remaining. Uh, it still does damage equal to its power. It'll still do three damage. Now, you'll notice that some creatures have abilities that say they trigger on reap or fight, and... Um, so it's tempting to think, well, only those creatures can reap or fight. But no, the truth is uh, any creature can reap or fight unless otherwise specified. Uh, but some creatures have special abilities that trigger when they do those things. But any creature can reap or fight. All right. Um, now, there are a couple other things, action and omni. Now, these can show up on a creature... And uh, if a creature has an action or omni ability, the creature can exhaust in order to use that ability um, instead of reaping or fighting. Oops. Wrong, uh, wrong button there. Hmm. Okay. So an action is, is something that <clears throat> you would exhaust <clears throat> exhaust the creature or artifact in order to do what it says. In this uh, example, Spectral Tunneler uh, can as a, can exhaust in order to do this text here, choose a creature, etc., etc. Um, Omni works exactly the same as Action, but it can be used uh, even when the card is off house. In other, in other words, even when this card's house isn't the active one you can still use an Omni ability. Uh, Omni abilities tend to be pretty cool. They often, but not always, end up, you know, they're, they're one-time use. They kill the card. Not always, but often. Um, okay. So, remember, anytime you use the card, whether it's Reaping, Fighting, Action, or Omni, uh, it, it does become exhausted. Okay. So, uh, the other thing you can do in step three is discard cards, but keep in mind you can only play discard or use cards from your active house. You can't play cards from any other house. If you have a creature from another house on the board, you can't use it, and uh, you also can't discard cards from another house. Now, why would you want to discard a card from your active house? Well, there are some cards that wouldn't accomplish anything at the moment, but you still don't want to, uh, you still don't want to keep them in your hand because you want to draw something else. So you go ahead and discard them. Um, you might even have a card that you know at a given moment would help your opponent more than you. So you say, well, I don't want to play that, and I don't even want to hold it around for later. So you might choose to discard it. But it's important to remember you can only play, discard, and use cards from that active house that you chose in step two. Again, uh, once step three ends, you go to step four, all your exhausted cards become ready, and then you go to step five, you draw up to six, until you have six cards in your hand. Okay. Um, quick note, uh, anytime, uh, anytime a card says to destroy a creature or artifact, that the creature or artifact is destroyed. It goes in the uh, in the discard pile. Um, sacrifice uh, means the same thing as destroy, but it's only used in reference to your own cards. Um, but it, it really, every time you see sacrifice, it could just say destroy. Uh, anytime that a creature's damage 
is equal to or greater than its power, it is destroyed. Now, it is worth noting that cards can leave play in other ways than being destroyed. Um, notably, there are some cards that say uh, return a card to its owner's hand. Some cards say uh, shuffle a card into its owner's deck. Uh, some say purge a card. We'll cover that later. Some even might say archive a card from play. Those are all ways that a card can leave play, can leave the table uh, without being destroyed. And it's important not to confuse those things. Um, just because a card leaves play doesn't necessarily mean that it was destroyed. Although most creatures and artifacts... Well, most creatures anyway, when they leave play, it's because they're destroyed. Okay, so uh, we'll come back and cover uh, some, some definitions and more advanced concepts at the end of this video. But uh, right now, I'm going to go ahead and hit pause on the slideshow and transition over to watching uh, my brother-in-law, Mark, and me play a game of Keyforge on Tabletop Simulator. Um, we're playing using decks that we actually own. Um, neither of them are really crazy good decks. They're, they're sort of middle of the road, fine decks. Um, and uh, anyway, I hope that, that that will help you. If you don't want to watch that, you can skip uh, ahead a bit and I'll be doing some wrap up uh, slides on some more advanced play concepts as well as if you're sold and you just want to get in and start playing the game, what do you need to by and how do you start finding people? So I uh, hope you enjoy the game. Okay. Uh, hey, hey, Mark. Thanks for joining me for this how to play video. Hey, Andrew. Thanks for inviting me. Happy to happy yeah. to be here. Now, uh, now we're we're doing this in Tabletop Simulator, which is on Steam. You have to pay money for it, uh, but there's some great forge uh mods for it that that work pretty well um normally if i'm just trying to get some practice games of keyforge in i would play on the crucible where it automates pretty much everything um way easier to use <laughs> yeah but for uh for for actually teaching slowing things down a little bit i think mm -hmm. this is really fantastic and it also gives us a little more of the look and feel of playing in real life i'd rather teach people in person but um, if I'm going to use technology, then I think this is the better tool for teaching. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, I think it's the best tool for practicing for, say, something like a tournament where you're going to be playing with real cards. And, and you need to not um, miss triggers. Right. Exactly. So being able to play your deck out how you would play it uh, in person um, is a pretty good practicing technique. Yeah. So we're mostly going to be focusing on how to play Keyforge, but there will be a little bit of... Uh, you know, how to use Tabletop Simulator kind of mixed in. Um, I'm really going to quick going to show my browser where I have open um, a link to my deck on keyforgegame.com. And then um, basically I uh, select and then copy the URL from there. And, uh, and then I can here in Tabletop Simulator, um, it's kind of uh, a little bit funny to, and um, but uh, I can click in this little iPad thingy over here and uh, paste in my URL there. I can't even really see it right, but then I can click build deck and uh, this will put together a deck for me. That is fantastic. Now, um, I don't know when this will work for uh, Age of Ascension decks and, you know, we're playing with all of the Archons decks right now, but um, I'm sure some enterprising soul will uh, update it before long to, to do Age of Ascension as well. That would be an exciting day. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I have the feeling this will be updated before the Crucible. So. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Um, There's probably a little, a little uh, less effort that goes into just creating all the image packs, but... Um, yeah, we'll see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, cool. Okay, so um, so I'll shuffle my deck there, and then uh, we can just roll, maybe for who goes first. Sounds good. Now I got an eight. 
eight. Is that right? I didn't know a I nine. nine. And you got sixteen. So uh, I didn't first. I didn't. I didn't roll. Oh, I didn't, oh, roll. You didn't roll. I okay. put mine down. Yeah. I see. Nope. Nope. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, oh uh, I two. get to go first. Okay. <laughs> so, um, go and put this back over here. So because I'm going first, uh, I draw seven cards in my starting hand. Um, and, and I draw six. Yep. And uh, and then the first thing I, do, I get to do is look at my hand and decide whether I'm going to keep or mulligan. Um, I'm, I'm not even going to consider it for right now because I just want to get into playing. But if mm -hmm. I were really concerned about winning, I might look and decide if I wanted to keep this set of cards. If I didn't want to keep it, I would mulligan, which means that I put these cards back in my deck, I reshuffle, uh, and then I would draw up to one fewer card, which in my case would be six cards. And in my case, it would be five. Yep. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Um, well, uh, since I'm going first, oh, uh, do you want a mulligan? I do not want a mulligan. I'm actually pretty happy with my houses. I, I am playing with a deck with Brobnar, Mars, and Dist. Uh -huh. And um, I'll normally mulligan if I have two of each house in there just to see uh, if I can get something more consistent. Because mm -hmm. um, the worst you can do is get two, two, one again of each house and sure. um, then you just play with whatever. But uh, I, I happen to have only two houses represented in my hand right now Mars and Brobnar. And I have half of each. So because I'm going second, I'm going to be able to play at least three cards. Cool. Okay. Well, uh, so I'm going to go first. And uh, on the first turn, the first player on their first turn may only play uh, or discard one card. So uh, I'm going to choose... Uh, I'm with, going to choose... with exception. There are exceptions. Yeah, <laughs> we, we, won't, we won't go into those right, right now. Uh, so, yeah, so I'm going to choose Sanctum, um, and I'm going to play Commander Remiel. Um, now, Commander Remiel comes out exhausted, um, but now I end my turn, so Commander Remiel becomes ready. And it's your turn. Awesome. And I will be playing Mars this turn. Okay. Uh, so the first card I'm going to play out is Grabber Jammer. It is a four-power, uh, one-armor creature. Um, that my opponent's keys cost plus one amber, and when he fights reaps, it captures one amber. Mm -hmm. Then I have an Exilo Bolter here, mm -hmm. uh, featured in the very first Vault Tour winning deck, and a three power fight reap deal two damage to a creature. If this damage destroys that creature, purge it. And then we have a rare card here, uh, the Cuxlix. Pixlix's Plague Master, mm -hmm. Fight Reap, deal three damage to each human creature. This damage cannot be prevented by armor. Okay. So just happens to work pretty well against Sanctum. Right, row. Yep. Okay. And uh, so then you at the so then you ready your cards and then you draw back up to six cards. I do. And uh, and then it's my turn. Mm hmm. Okay. Well, let's see here. Um, boy, I am not a fan of that Plague Master. Um, I'm going to I'm going to choose Untamed and uh I'm going to play two copies of Full Moon, which is a little bit unfortunate. Oh boy. <laughs> um, but um, cuz cuz what Full Moon does is it for the remainder of my turn, I gain an amber each time I play a creature and I'm not going to play a creature this turn. So but I'm going to play Curiosity, uh, which gains me one amber. I always gain the amber first. Um, Got it. Destroys each scientist and creature. And it destroys each scientist creature. So, goodbye to Quick Slicks. <laughs> Destroyed. All right. And then I need to uh, draw up to six. And it's your turn. All right. Well, um, this turn... I usually, I, so when I'm ch looking at my hand and trying to decide what house to play that turn, mm -hmm. I choose either between the house that I have the most cards of in my hand, or if I am able to do a mix of actions of creatures that are already out and being able to play more cards down. 
I'm going to be choosing Brobnar this time. Okay. And um, even though I don't have any creatures out here, I have a couple of cards in my hand that will actually work out pretty well. Cool. So I have Bilgum Avalanche, which is a five power creature after I forge a key, deal two damage to each enemy creature. And then I have Blood of Titans, which is an upgrade that adds five power to a creature. I'm going to put that on this Grabber Jammer. Mm -hmm. So this Grabber Jammer now has nine power. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then Yikes. Oh, I gain an Amber. I gain an Amber from that. Yep. And then I'm going to play Smith, which is an action, and I'm going to gain an Amber, because, and then I'm going to gain two more, because I control more creatures more than, than you me. do. Yep. Okay. That'll bring you so up. That's, I'm up to four Amber. Okay. You got some big stuff out, too. Yeah, it's uh, it seems so, so far. <laughs> All right. Um... Well, I'm going to choose to play uh, Shadows this turn. So, and, and yeah, it's worth noting, because I'm choosing Shadows, I don't get to use Commander Remiel. Uh, and, you know, because you were Brobnar, you didn't get to use your Mars creatures. But uh, right. you, I, I want to get more cards through my hand. So I'm going to play Miasma, which makes you skip the Forge a Key Step on your next turn. Um, and it gets me an Amber, which is the part I really care about. Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. uh, I'll play Mesa's Asp, which um, the the reason I'd like to have it on the board uh, is that it has Skirmish and Poison. So that means that if I get a chance to use it, I can kill any of your creatures without losing the Mesa's Asp. Uh, and you have some stuff I'd love to kill. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then Naughty the Thief who can exhaust to steal one, which is a nice ability. So uh, now I ready my cards. Okay. And I draw uh, three more cards so that I have six. And it's your turn. Okay. Um, well, now that I have a good... So I happen to get a pretty good draw on this last turn. Um I have a good Mars set up so far on the board. I drew a couple of Mars creatures into my hand this last turn. I actually have four Mars creatures in my hand that I can play right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to choose Mars. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing I'm going to do is demonstrate a mechanic that we haven't seen so far, and that's Capture. So I have this uh, card, Exili Marauder. Um, which is a two power creature. Um, and when you play it, you capture one for each friendly ready Mars creature. It's a bit. Um, and I have two friendly ready Mars creatures here. Um, definitely situational. The situation meets, meets that it, it came together pretty well for this mm -hmm. one. Um, and then. So now, now, yeah. uh, if I kill him, I get those back. You do. Um, so I, I have hope still. Um, but because of his special ability on there, he gets plus one power for each amber that's on him. So, so that means uh, it's effectively a four power creature at this point. Correct. Correct. Yes. And um, so, yeah, you just need to be careful with what you're attacking it with um, and all that. Um, okay, so next thing I'm going to do is play out my other Mars creatures before I use the okay. ones on the board. So I'm going to put out my second mm -hmm. Grabber Jammer. So keys now cost plus two, so one for each Grabber Jammer. Okay. Total of eight. We have a special card here, um, Uxlix the Zookeeper. Um, he is a two power creature. He's elusive. And when he reaps, I need to put, if I can, an enemy creature into my archives. Um, so that means then it, it's not available to me 
unless you decide to access your archives, in which point it, it would come back to my hand. Correct. And I don't think it's optional. I think you have to do it uh, for this one. Yep, yep. It does not yeah. say me. Yeah. So next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to reap oh, with... Oh, wait, 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 wait. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Zorg. Didn't do something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Zorg, Zorg seven power, enters place stunned because yep. he has a powerful before fight ability uh, yep. to be able to stun creatures... Basically, the creature he fights and the creatures next to the creature yep. he fights. Okay. Uh, yeah. After that, I'm going to reap with Exila Bolter, uh, gain an amber. Yep. His reap ability, like I mentioned earlier, was deal two damage to a creature. I'm yep. going to do it to your naughty right so here. So naughty goes into my discard, right? Uh, no, actually. It, according to oh. the text on Exila Bolter, if this damage destroys that creature... Purge it. All right. So purge is a new keyword. Um, purging removes the creature entirely from the game. Yep. You don't get to see that card ever again yep. for the game. So I'll just set it over here out of the way. That sounds good. Okay. And lastly, going to reap with Grabber Jammer. You don't have any um, amber to for me to capture. So all it will do is gain me an amber. Mm -hmm. And that puts me at a total of six amber. Yep. Um, which, if I still have six amber on my next turn, I will be able to forge a key. So you say? So I say. You and say, because I have two cards check. in my hand. Oh, I say <laughs> check, yes. <laughs> okay. So, so I say. Um, I have two cards in my hand, so I drop to my yep. hand size of six. Mm-hmm. And uh, pass turn to you. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, I'm going to choose to play Sanctum this time. Um, I'm actually going to start by using my cards that are on the board. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going to use Commander Remiel to reap. And Commander Remiel has the special ability that when when she reaps, uh, you can use a friendly non-Sanctum creature. So when I reap with Commander Remiel, I'm going to use the Mesa's Asp. And what I'm going to do with the Mesa's Asp is fight. Um, what I'm going to fight is uh, this Grabber Jammer that has the Blood of Titans on it. Good choice. It is a <laughs> big, it's a big creature yeah. that would destroy just about every other yeah. creature that attacks it. So, yeah. And plus, your creature gets to stay on the board because of Skirmish. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. Because because Mesa's Asp has skirmish, uh, it does damage to the grabber jammer, but the grabber jammer doesn't deal damage back. And because Mesa's Asp has poison, uh, it kills the uh, nine power with one armor. Uh, well, basically, the armor prevents one of the damage, so it does two damage mm -hmm. to the grabber jammer. But because of poison, two damage is enough to kill the grabber jammer. So right uh, now yeah. and then and poison is cool because if even one point of damage makes it onto the creature you want to get rid of it completely destroys it right and and then I play a raiding knight which has the effect play capture one uh, so I get to have one of your amber on there that reduces your cooldown to five which means you you'll skip you well you won't skip the forge a key step but it won't it won't work you won't be able to forge. Uh I will not be able to forage. Um, and then I play Cleansing Wave, which has the effect of healing one damage from each creature and gaining me an, an amber for each creature healed that way. Right now, there are no damaged creatures, so uh, nothing happens. Um, all right. And then I ready my cards. I draw back up to six. And then it is your turn. Perfect. Well... Um, one thing that I'm going to do right now is I, again, I'm going to evaluate, um, what I can do right now. I don't have any Mars cards in my hand. Um, I have four disc cards and two Brobnar cards. Um, Brobnar isn't the house, definitely isn't the house I want to play. Um, and I have cards in here like, um, Gun which is damage 
I have uh, Poltergeist, which gets rid of an artifact. There's no artifacts out there, but it gains me an Amber. Um, I have a Toxin, which it wouldn't be useful this turn, be useful the next turn, and I have a Succubus. Mm -hmm. um, but I have a really good Mars board state, and when you have a good Mars board state, you want to be able to use that while that's out there. Right. Because you you've taken a couple of turns to set it up. Mars yep. is one of those houses that once you set it up, it needs to be used while it's there. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll go ahead and use the cards that are out here. Um, first thing I'm going to do is reap with Exlix the Zookeeper mm -hmm. and trigger his reap ability to put an enemy creature into my archive. Mm -hmm. um, I am going to put your Mesis Asp into okay. my. So let's go ahead and flip him over there. Yep. Put it right there. Um, archives remain face down. I am able to check what is in my archive at any point. Um, you are not able to check my archive. Um, and now, now, interesting point too, this happened when the Grabber Jammer was destroyed. It also happens in this case that there's now a gap in my battle line, so I, I'll just close them in. Yep. 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 And on here, it makes it really easy. There's like an invisible grid that it snaps mm -hmm. to. So uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, next thing I'm going to do is um, I'm actually going to fight with my Grabber Jammer. Okay. And I'm going to uh, have him fight against your Commander Remiel. Okay. And capture your one, your one Amber. Right. So because his ability says fight, reap, he captured he, the other one captured when it would have captured when it reaped. Um. This one captures captured when it fought. Okay. Exactly. And I'm going to go and put two damage onto yep. onto him right there. Two e Commander Remiel dealt three, but your armor prevented one of them. Prevented one, yes. So okay. I captured your amber, put two damage onto it. Got so it. next thing I'm going to do is um, I don't want to give you any of this amber <laughs> just yet. Uh -huh. So I'm going to actually reap with that okay. as well. That yep. uh, brings me up to seven. I'm going to use Zorg to unstun him. So when a creature's stunned and you go to do anything with it, fight or reap or do an action or omni ability, uh, it instead of that ability working, it exhausts, unstuns, and then nothing happens. Nothing happens besides the fact that it gets unstunned. So it didn't and fight. It didn't reap. Exactly. It didn't yeah. Hang so out with people who we <laughs> and that's important. So if it's wearing something like an upgrade, like rocket boot, which has fight, reap, ready this creature, yeah. unstunning is not fighting or reaping. Right. So unstunning is just even unstunning. though it was trying to fight or reap. It, it didn't. right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Which brings in to call other cards uh, that I, yeah. I won't go into right now. But um, okay. I'm going to use Exila Bolter to reap as well. Do two damage. It, it does nothing to your Raiding yep. Knight because of your two armor. It burns the armor, yep. And gain one last amber. Okay. That brings me up to eight amber. Got it. Okay. And that's the end of my turn. I don't draw any because I'm all the at six card. Right. Okay. Right, because you didn't play any. Okay. I am going to do Shadows this turn. I have four Shadows cards. so But the other awesome. reason that I'm excited to play Shadows is because I can prevent you from forging a key. So, um, <laughs> so Again. <laughs> yeah, again. Uh, so I'm first going to play Miasma, which gains me one Amber, and mm -hmm. says that uh, my opponent skips the Forge a Key step on their next turn. So even if you have six Amber, you, you won't get to use it. Um Next, I'm going to play Too Much to Protect. And Too Much to Protect Great is card. a really powerful card. Yeah, it gains me one amber. And then I steal all but six of your amber. So you drop down to six. I get mm -hmm. the other two that you had. Um, next, I'm going to play Nerve Blast, which steals one amber. There you and go. And if I do, which I did, I deal two damage to a creature. I would like to deal two damage to Uxlix the Zookeeper. Nice. Yeah. We're going to do it to kill Exlix. Kill that guy. Get a little Exlix. <laughs> and two damage uh, does immediately destroy it. Elusive does not prevent direct damage. 
So if, right. uh, if you're attacking, then it would miss right away uh, for the first attack, but direct damage like Nerve Blast ignores Elusive. Right, and yeah, just to, just to reiterate, uh, the, the specific rules text for Elusive says the first time this creature is attacked each turn, no damage is dealt. But as you pointed out, um, the, when, it, when a card just says deal damage, that's not an attack. That's just dealing damage. So Elusive mm -hmm. is just not relevant for that moment. Um, exactly. Okay. And then the last card I'm going to play out is Subtle Maul, uh, which is an artifact that I can exhaust in order to uh, make you discard a random card from your hand. It does not have that effect this turn. It comes out exhausted. But on my next Shadow's turn, hopefully, it'll be sitting here ready. I'll get to use it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I do ready it now, and then I draw four cards up to six. So I have six cards again, and um, boy, I I have five amber. You have five amber. Um, my key cost is seven. Yeah, but you you sure have a lot of things on the board. So we'll see how this works out. All right. Yeah, I, I have a lot of things on the board, but. Um, that subtle mall that you put out changes how I want to play. Mm -hmm. um, I had mentioned last turn the discards that I have. Mm -hmm. And I actually had the opportunity to get rid of a few cards out of your hand okay. right now. And uh, to Spooky. and so I can show... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and this is something that this does pretty well. They, they change up the game state a lot and all that. Yep. But all right. uh, the first, first thing I'm going to do is play that card Gone Goozle. Okay. which is an action card. Uh, deal three damage to a creature. If it is not destroyed, its owner discards a random card from their hand. Uh -huh. So I'm going to go ahead and deal that three damage to the Raiding Knight. It only effectively does one. Yep, so... Because it burns two, two armor and then deals one damage. Now, uh, just this is me being OCD, but before we do anything else, can you get your Amber? From oh, yeah. Diesel? Sorry, what's that? Get, you got to get your Amber. Oh, yes. Thank you. Okay. So you get my uh, Amber from okay. Gungoozle. Do the <laughs> one damage, damage. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> after getting the Amber. <laughs> and and then, then you just start a random card from your hand. Now, uh, can you... Mm, do you mind just picking a number between one and six? And I'll be honest. Uh, sure. Normally, Two. Now, if we're playing in person, what I would do... What I would like to do is actually put the cards face down on the table. And let you Here. physically can touch you see, one. But... Can you see your hand? I think I can yeah. take it. I think I can take one out. Can you? Try. Ooh, spooky. Okay. Look at that. Nice. All right. You got one stood against many. Ooh. Okay. okay. All right. And the next thing I'm going to do mm -hmm. is play that other card I showed you, Poltergeist, mm -hmm. which uh, will get it. Yeah. But let's just follow the card really quick. So I gain an amber, mm -hmm. and then I will use an artifact controlled by any player you're the only one with yep. an artifact so i'll use it now it says that my opponent discards a random card from my hand from their hand so you you do that right now the card poltergeist says use an artifact controlled by any player as if it were your so ah. we're treating the text on the card as if this artifact were all now right. mine all right so, so you get to take another card out of my hand i do get to take one more card Great. out of your hand yeah Fun times. <laughs> no, not that one. Not that one. So we'll go for that. And Vigor, right. which is an untamed action. Yep. And then at the very end, it says to destroy that artifact. All right. There we go. I've gained the amber from that. I actually already oh, did that. Oh, the humanity. Okay. <laughs> and finally, we have a couple more disc creatures to put oh. out. Succubus and Toxin. Okay. So so Succubus will make me draw one less card at the end of my turn. And Toxin can reap to make me discard a random card. So that seems like a pretty decent combo. Okay. Yeah, it allows to keep your hand pretty small. Yeah. Um, yes, okay. indeed. So I have two cards in my hand at the end of my turn. Sorry, these guys technically come out yeah. exhausted. I ready these guys. I have two cards, so I draw four back up to my full hand size of six. Way to brag. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, and then, um, 
Right. So now um, you, you and that's check, check again, for yeah? me. Okay. Okay. What shall I do? All right. I am going to play sync them. Awesome. Um, I'm going to use the raiding knight to fight the grabber jammer. Awesome. Grabber so, jammer only needs two more damage to destroy yeah, it. Yeah, and I, so I do four, that... so it prevents one, three goes through, and that's enough to kill it. You do four to me, my armor prevents two, so I take two more. That's three damage, which is not quite enough to destroy the raiding knight. And then I will play, so I get my one amber back there so i'm at six that's enough to put me on mm -hmm. check and then uh i'll play protectrix out of my hand as well um that's it so i'll ready those um i'll draw two more cards up to five because of the succubus and uh, -huh. uh and then yep. i will say check all right and that's one thing that's different about Tabletop Simulator versus the Crucible online. Um, you need to actually remember those triggers um, and be aware that those things are happening. Right. Yep. So I own, So my key cost is six. The first step of my turn is to forge a key if I can afford it. Yep. Um, so I have six amber here. I will go ahead and pay that and flip the first key of the game. Nice. Well done. Oh, and when that happens, uh, we have build them trigger avalanche triggers yeah. here since a couple of turns into yeah, the game. First turn of the game. Um, so build them avalanche. After you forge a key, deal two damage to each enemy creature. Now your armor on raiding knight regenerated at the end of your yeah. turn, so that only destroys the armor on there, uh, but it does do two damage to your protectrix. Yep. Yeah. All right. Okay, so let me see here. I want to take advantage of your Raiding Knight having no armor. Okay. Um, but there's nothing from my hand that I want to play. Mm -hmm. So um, basically okay, I have three Brobnar... Yeah, I have three Brobnar cards <laughs> and two discards and one Mars card. The Mars card I have in my hand is not very good, and I just want to get rid of it, so I'm actually going to play Mars this turn. Okay. So, Phosphorus Stars, it's a action card placed on each non-Mars creature, but it gains you two chain. So, it, it's a tall price to pay. My board is... Yeah, you would hurt your board more than you would hurt I would, my board. I would hurt my board a lot. So I'm going to actually discard that card. I don't. I don't okay. want to play that one. I don't want the chains. I don't want the stun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I do not next like thing I'm going. I am. <laughs> exactly. Um, next thing I'm going to do is reap mm -hmm. with my Xelo Bolter to do mm -hmm. two damage to your raiding knight with no armor. Yep. Um, so I gain that amber back. So, and this gets uh, purged. And that one gets purged. So it because joins your Nani. Knight's ability, yep. Or not because of Ra because of Ixil Bolter's ability, yep. Okay. Right. And then I am actually going to... I'm not going to fight with that. You have six Amber, and there's nothing I can do about that this turn. Um, so I'm just going Good. to Reap mm -hmm. and gain Amber. And then Zorg is going to reap as well. Okay. And Zorg the we reap are... Machine. Zorg the reap machine, yeah. And then we are back at the end of my turn. I'm going to ready my creatures. I have five cards, so I draw one. And pass turn back to you. Cool. Okay. Um, so I, I pay six and forge a key. That's, I'll take it. <laughs> um, I'm going to choose to go Shadows this turn. Uh, I'm going to awesome. start by playing Ring of Invisibility onto my Ooh, Protectrix. Uh, that gains card. me an Amber, and then Ring of Invisibility gives this creature Elusive and Skirmish. So that's pretty cool. Very good. That is pretty cool. 
Um, I'll play Ghostly Hand, which gains me two amber. And then the text on Ghostly Hand says, if my opponent has exactly one amber, I steal it. But you have four, so I don't steal. And then I'll play Nexus. Uh, Nexus, when, when it reaps, lets me use uh, one of your artifacts as if it were mine. You don't have any right now, but um, still might as well play it out on the board. Uh, it becomes ready. And then I draw another three cards up to five uh, because of that succubus. Right. Okay. Well, um, I have a new mechanic that I'm actually pretty excited that I get to use this <laughs> this game because <laughs> uh -oh. it's pretty hard to use. Uh -huh. um, so I'm going to play Dist this turn. Okay. And because you forged a key on your last turn... Um, I'm going to play Key Hammer, which, uh -oh. um, uh -huh. unforges your last key okay. and gives you six amber. Yep. And yep. that's an important thing to know is that even if you didn't forge a key, oh, I gained an amber from that too. Even if you didn't forge a key, you would right. still gain six amber. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay. Yep. Okay. Couple of other things I'm going to do with this. I'm going to play out a Shuler, mm, who okay. is a five power creature, and if you have more than four amber, I steal one. Okay. Um, so key hammer was important. Um, yeah. In the Shuler, I get that amber from you. Yep. And then I have Snudge, whose mm -hmm. reap ability is to return an artifact or flank creature to its owner's hand. Mm -hmm. And then I'm just going to reap, reap with both those two amber. And when you reap with the toxin, you uh, get to knock a card out of my hand. Discard a random card out of your hand, yes. So let's go for this one. Okay. Oh, no. Not my ancient bear. All right. Teddy bear. Your poor teddy bear. Yep. Okay. All right. Ready my creatures. Draw back up to six. Nice. Okay. And you are at check. Okay. Well, I forge this time. Uh, for six again. Um, mm -hmm. so I get that key back, but I have one less amber because he stole one from me. Um, and I'm gonna go with untamed this turn. Um, hmm, it's kind of not what I want. I'd I'd really like to kill your succubus and toxin, but I just I'm behind on board state. So, um, so we're gonna go untamed. I'll play out uh niffle ape. And another Niffle Ape. Now, the Niffle Apes, they're three power, which isn't too crazy, but they ignore, when they're attacking, they ignore Taunt and Elusive, uh, which you don't have any of that out right now, but uh, but it's a thing that exists. Um, and that's something I always forget how to, that they can do. Yeah. It, it's, <laughs> it's very easy to forget. Yeah. Um, and then I play Dust Pixie, which is a one power creature, but it gains me two amber when it's Played, pushing me up to four which is not bad um then uh i'm actually going to discard my last card which is a key charge it's a really it's a strong card in certain situations um but for me because i'm i'm be if you're ahead it's great because if you have seven amber you you play this you lose one and then you forge a key at current cost which is typically six um, and then I don't have to worry about you stealing it or doing other weird stuff. But <laughs> um, when, when since I'm behind, I'm really just more worried about getting more cards in my hand that might help me uh, scramble together uh, a chance. So um, so now I'm going to draw back. I ready my creatures. I'm going to draw back up to five, and it's your turn. Perfect. All right. Well, the first thing I'm going to do on this turn, I have I'm going to do the Forge a key step. Uh -huh. Belgium Avalanche is still out on the board, um, yep. fortunately. <laughs> um, so we're going to do two damage um, to each other creature. Each enemy creature, uh, yeah. Each enemy creature, that is correct, which would destroy uh, the Dust Pixie. Um, yep. um, I am going to be... Okay. So I am going to actually play play Brobnar this turn. Okay. Uh, only reason About is time. I have 
Yeah, I have a handful of Brobnar cards. So if yep. you had Restring and Tiss out on the board, I would not be able to <laughs> to play at all. <laughs> so uh, we're going to you reap with Bilgum Avalanche to gain that Amber. Then I'm going to put out a few cards. We're going to put out War Chest, mm -hmm. uh, which is an artifact. Uh, gain one damage for each enemy creature that was destroyed in a fight this turn. Important to remember to use that at the end of your turn. Yep. Don't use it at the beginning. <laughs> uh, Valder, which is a six power giant, uh, deals two, plus two damage while attacking a creature on a flank. Mm -hmm. Then we have Grenade Snib, mm -hmm. which when it is destroyed, gains, uh, or your opponent loses two amber. We're going to put out Smash to stun this Niffle Ape here. Uh, that's his playability. He's five power giant. Play a stunner creature. Mm -hmm. And fire spitter. Mm -hmm. uh, before a fight, deal one damage to each enemy creature. And finally, we have tremor, which will stun this creature and each creature next to it. All right. Lots of stunning happening. Lots of creatures coming out. I apologized. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, creatures can be really strong, um, for sure. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to go with uh, Sanctum this turn. Um, yeah, I was hoping for one particular outcome that, that isn't going to happen now, but um, okay, that's all right. Let's, uh, so Sanctum... Um, I'm going to start by playing Potion of Invulnerability. Um, this is an artifact. It has uh, it has Omni. Sacrifice Potion of Invulnerability for the remainder of the turn. Each friendly creature cannot be dealt damage. So that's strong in the right scenario. Um, I'm going to play mm -hmm. Take Hostages, which says that for the remainder of the turn, each time a friendly creature fights, it captures one. I gain the Amber for that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm going to play protect the weak that's going to go on protectrix um i gain an amber for it and it gives protectrix plus one armor and taunt so you can't fight protectrix's neighbors as long as protectrix is alive um so protectrix now has elusive skirmish taunt and an armor oh um, my goodness <laughs> yeah i'm now going to unstun protectrix uh by trying to fight um, now because I did not actually fight, take hostages does not trigger. So, uh, that's that. I ready Protectrix and Potion, and then draw back up to, uh, oops, oops, I accidentally drew too many there. Um, draw up to five, and, uh, it is now your turn. Okay. Uh, oh, this turn. Oh, awesome. Um, you have seven, right? I have seven. Yep. Uh -oh. Okay. Um, uh, no, don't worry. There's <laughs> <laughs> there there are a, a couple of cards, a few cards that uh, do bad things to your opponent's amber if they have seven or more. Exactly, but. Um, don't worry, I don't have any of those cards in my okay. hand. <laughs> um, this turn I'm actually going to play Dis because forgot, there's an interesting... To flip your... Oh, I did. You're right. I, thank you. It, it is on both players to maintain the game state, so yes, thank you yes. for that. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, so I, I'm actually going to play Dis this turn because there's a couple of cool creatures uh, okay. that I wanted to show off um, that they interact differently. Uh, this first one is called Tentacus. Uh, Tentacus um, is a five power demon. Your opponent must pay you one amber in order to use an artifact. So uh, instead of me stealing it from him, he should be able to willingly give me an amber <laughs> um, if he wants to use his uh -huh. creature, uh, use his artifacts. So uh, we're going to put that one on that. Um, on that flank, we'll put this one over here and trying to get yep. this to line. Okay. 
And um, next thing we're going to do is just go ahead and um, I'm actually going to, oh, I can't, this has an armor. Okay, this is, this is gonna fight your protect, Protectrix and it has break. Elusive. Yeah, um, so it's gonna break the elusive. Yep. And then I'm going to have um, Snudged fight Protectrix. Okay, so they both die. And so they both die. Yes, yes, okay. they both die. <laughs> and because, all right, so because Snudge died, because Snudge got destroyed, yep. its fight ability does not trigger. Right, so you would have been able so, to return an artifact or flint creature to my hand. Right. Probably you would do it to me, but um, because he died, that doesn't trigger. Okay. So yeah, it would have been more... A, a, or Schuler doesn't die. Right, right, okay, yeah. So it would have been more effective for me to probably fight with do the opposite. Nudge first. That way it would still go into effect. I'd still be able to return something. Uh, but because that didn't happen, um, I don't get to do that. That's okay. You can afford to give me some charity here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's the end of my turn. I ready. Oh, wait. Never mind. It's not. Um, Toxin is going to reap. Yeah. And Succubus is going to reap. So I have five Amber just and you below. You have to knock a card out of my hand, too. Yeah, so we're going to go ahead and grab this one here. Okay. No, old Bruno. Okay. Um, and because of shaffles at the end of your turn, I lose one. Uh, but I still have enough to forge. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to lose my last six amber and forge a key. So we're now tied on keys. You have five amber and a lot of creatures, and uh, and I don't. <laughs> but um, But we'll see what we can do here. Okay. So, uh, so I'm going to go with Untamed this time. Okay. And uh, I'm going to start by playing... Hmm. Hmm. I guess I'm going to start by playing Lost in the Woods. So Lost oh. in the Woods gains me an Amber. And then... Uh, I choose two friendly creatures and two enemy creatures and shuffle them into their owner's decks. So I'm actually going to pick uh, this Nexus, my Nexus, and um, also one of my Niphilapes. And uh, they'll get shuffled, and then um, you have four cards left in your deck, so I actually think the Exili Marauder is not such a great choice at the moment. Um, maybe, uh, maybe, like, that's actually a tough choice, but I think the Grenade Snib and, um, fire spitter okay cool um, both good choices uh you know what not the, actually not the fire spitter i'm sorry uh it's gonna be shaffles i, I was going to mention like why aren't you picking yeah shaffles? it should be <laughs> <laughs> um yeah both so both of the cards that you picked are amber controlling yeah. cards it's it's they rough you have a lot of cards that i would like to not have on the board but yeah uh, pick your battles uh, yeah. Um, so when it comes down to choosing creatures, choosing between between creatures, creatures that prevent you from gaining amber or keeping amber in your pool are, are really good to get rid of. Uh, they're really good to prioritize yeah. uh, getting rid of. Yep. And and you know the Marauder getting rid of it would get me two amber right away, but it would also um, you know it would come right back out and be worse actually. Um, very potentially, it's, it's yeah. It's not. It's not becoming a worse threat as it sticks out. Whereas the shaffles is hurting me every turn. Um, then um, I'll I'll exhaust the niflape to unstun it. Um, <laughs> you want that back, huh? Uh, I'll play hunting witch, which uh, is a really great creature that gains me an amber each time I play another creature. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any other creatures to play this turn. 
Then I'll play Nocturnal Maneuver, which gains me one Amber, and then I get to exhaust up to three creatures. And I will choose Oxen, Fire Spitter, and Exilo Bolter. Perfect. Um, now I still only draw up to five. So sad. Oh, you know what? I never shuffled, so let me do that really quick. Oh, you know what? I never shuffled either. And I actually put them into my oh, discard. discard pile. Hey, that's a good thing. <laughs> Ooh, and then I drew Double. my old deck. That's fantastic. <laughs> Close one. There you go. All right. Let's see if I can do this. <laughs> nice. Yes. All right. Your turn. Perfect. Okay. So um, here's what I'm going to do on this turn. I'm going to play Brobnar. Okay. And uh, the first thing I'm going to do is play out a, a War Song. Uh oh. Allows me to. Gain an amber each time a friendly creature fights. Yep. I have three creatures out. Unfortunately, you only have two creatures on your side. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're going to go. Valder is going to fight your, your Nifilate. And okay. Smash is going to fight uh, the Hunting Witch. So I gain an amber for each of those fights. Uh, you gain damage. I do gain so damage. Valder yeah. takes three. Three. And Smash takes two. Smash two. And after that, I'm going to reap with Vilga Avalanche. Yep. And then activate my war chest, mm. which gives me two. Yep. Uh, for All the right. two creatures that were destroyed this turn. So that puts you on ten, right? Total of ten, yes. Okay. And then everything's ready. All right. Everything is ready. I am going to go... <laughs> Sank them. Uh, I'm going to play a Raiding Knight, which is going to capture one. Nice. So that's something. Uh, Commander Remiel is going to come out. Play Terms of Redress, which gains me one Amber and captures two more of yours. Um, and then I can't do anything else, so I pass my turn and draw back up to... Uh, well, I would draw... Uh, okay, I have to... So, when I get to the end of my deck, I need to draw one more card. I'm going to take my discard pile. It becomes my deck. I shuffle it. And now uh, I draw one more card. And then I pass turn. It's the end of my turn. And... I check to see if I have enough amber. I do. Shock. I for I pay that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then I forge uh, my life. Good game, good game. Good game. Good game. Um, I finally drew a Radiant Truth, <laughs> which would stun each enemy creature not on a flank, which would have actually given me a fighting chance. That would have done a lot yeah. <laughs> of work. That is that is how draw order works. Yes. Every time. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, um, yeah, thanks for thanks for doing this. I think we covered you know, a good uh, broad smattering of topics. If there were any, uh, if there were any that... I know there were some that we missed, but uh, I'll try to make sure in the video, in the clip that we're putting before this one, we don't leave any of the basics out. Um, and then, uh, you know, if, if you want, uh, you know, to go deeper um, after this, we have some, uh, there are some videos up about uh, how to analyze decks, how to prepare for events if, if you want to start getting competitive. Although I would definitely say just have fun for a while. Uh, but if you want to start getting competitive, we have some videos about that. And then um, uh, Mark and I did videos digging through all the cards in Call of the Archons. If you want a full run through of those, uh, we'll, we'll be doing similar videos for Age of Ascension. Um, and I think at some point we're going to do, we'll probably end up doing a video where we go through the entire FAQ 
you so you can get all the mm -hmm. weird niche rules read to you by <laughs> and it, there's a lot of them lovely voice yeah <laughs> Um, so cool. Any, any closing thoughts, Mark? You know, I, I, yeah. So I think it was really cool to, to play through the game with you. Um, you can read the rules and you can speculate how things are done, but honestly, the best way to learn how to play the game is just to play it yep. and, uh, being able to see how a game is played and the flow and how, um, explanation here and there of how things work. Um, it's really cool to be able to see. I wish I had it when I first started the game. Mm. Um, but, um, yeah, being able to s see the flow of the game and how it works is, is pretty cool. So you can rewatch this if you, uh, missed anything or, uh, didn't understand, or you can always, uh, ask questions too. Yeah. And you know, here's a, here's a pro tip that, you know, you get to the end of playing in a situation like this and there's a really easy mis uh, mistake to make, which is not taking back cards that your opponent took into their archives <laughs> I didn't uh, think and you not taking back cards that you purged. <laughs> um, I have, I have made those mistakes before and had people almost walk away with my cards as well as, uh, you know, forgetting to shuffle cards back in, um, and not finding out until much later and, uh, both suck. So, so, uh, <laughs> anyway, there, there you, uh, I did almost forget both things. <laughs> and uh there's your there's your pro tip so great uh well thanks so much mark for taking the time to do this with me i yeah. really enjoyed getting my butt kicked uh <laughs> and um yeah everybody get out there and forge some keys of your own have fun thanks all right i hope you enjoyed that uh game of key forge with me and my brother-in-law um now that you've seen the game played, I wanted to sort of walk through some more advanced concepts. Just to reiterate on the turn order, the first thing you do on every turn is forge a key if you can afford it. By default, keys cost six amber. Notice it's a key, not two keys. It's, it's just one per turn. Second step is you choose a house. That house is your active house for the whole turn. Immediately after choosing a house, you can return your archives to your hand. Step three is play, discard, and use. You can only play, discard, and use cards from the active house. So you can play cards from your hand, discard cards straight from your hand to the discard pile without playing them, and use creatures and artifacts that are on the table. But again, only ones that are of the house you chose in step two. Step four, uh, you take all your exhausted cards and you ready them. And then step five, you draw cards until you have six in your hand by default. All right, so uh, we, when talking about step two, we mentioned archive. What, what does that mean to archive a card? Well, your archives are a special out-of-play area uh, that a card can get stashed, um, and then it can get returned to your hand at the start of your turn. So let's say, for example, that uh, I have Hidden Stash and Urchin in my hand on turn one. And I think, well, Urchin is a great card. It, it'll let me steal one. But right now, my opponent doesn't have any Amber, so it, it won't do me any good. But I have Hidden Stash in my hand, so and I can only play one card this turn. So I'll play that. I'll play Hidden Stash. I'll gain one Amber, and then I'll ar archive a card. Well, I put Urchin face down in a special out-of-play area. I put it sideways so that it's clear that it's different from my deck. Um, and it stays there. Well, at that point... Uh, Let's say it was I was first player. I had seven cards in my hand. Well, I played Hidden Stash out, and I archived Urchin. So now I'm down to five cards in my hand. I would still draw up to six. Now let's say that my opponent plays some cards. They gain some Amber, and I think, you know what? On this turn, I do want to play Urchin. So on my second turn, I have six cards in my hand and Urchin in my archive. I could say, I'm going to play Shadows, and I'm going to return my archives into my hand. So now I, I pick up the archives and uh, it becomes part of my hand. I now have seven cards in my hand. That's fine. Um, so archives is a nice way to free up space in your hand. It also is a good way to stash cards out of the way that will be more useful later. One important thing to know is that when you return your archives to your hand, you do return the whole archive. So it each time you get to step two, you choose your active house, 
you can either leave your archives alone or return all your archives to your hand. All right, the next concept is steal. Um, stealing just means moving an amber from your opponent's pool to your pool. So ultimately you gain an amber and they lose one. And uh, some people prefer to play um, where, you know, if they steal from you, uh, you just take one of your tokens and put it back in your, in your box and they take a token out of their box and put it on their pool. Um, just so your tokens don't get mixed. Um, I, I just try to respect whatever other people are used to. Um, capturing is a specific uh, game element where, whereby uh, you take amber from your opponent's pool and you put it on one of your creatures, um, typically. There's a, a couple ways where you could put it on their creatures, but uh, typically you put it on your own. And um, this means it's not available to them. They can't spend it. They can't do anything with it. You can't steal it from them either. Um, but it, so it just isn't in their pool. It's on your creature. And it stays there until your creature is destroyed. And when your creature is destroyed, they get that amber back. And the rule is that anytime a creature is destroyed, any amber that's on it goes to the opponent, goes to uh, the opponent of the person who controlled that creature. Um, but generally speaking, when you when you capture, the amber goes on, you're, you're keeping it from your opponent, but it's only temporary. And there is this card, Blood Money, for example, that places two amber from the common supply on an enemy creature. That means that when you kill that creature, the, those two amber will go to your pool. Okay, and then uh, Stun is a, is a neat effect that to take a creature out of play, or out of, not out of play, literally, but... Um, from being used to keep the creature from being useful to your opponent for a while. Um, when you stun a creature, you put uh, you need to put a marker or a, a token on it to show that it's stunned. Uh, a stunned creature, the next time it tries to do anything, if the next time its owner its controller tries to use it, it will exhaust and unstun and then do nothing else. So for example, if I have a stunned creature, and I try to use it to reap, it exhausts, it loses the stun token, but it does not reap. And so that means I don't get an amber, and if it had a special reap ability, that does not trigger. Okay, a uh, few more ideas here. Uh, purge is a, is a game term that means to remove a card from the game. Um, when uh, when you run out of cards in your deck, you actually turn your discard pile over, you shuffle it, and you draw from it. So, uh, so you, your cards can come back, you might see them a second time, but when you purge a card, it becomes removed from the game. It, I usually put it under my Archon card so that I can keep track of it and won't lose it, but won't accidentally shuffle it back in, and it's just, it's just gone. There's no way to get it back. Armor, uh, in this case, by the way, this example, Ixila Bolter, um, has this ability that, that he does two, two damage to a creature, and if that damage destroys the creature, then it gets purged. But there are other cards that can purge as well. Uh, armor is shown here on the little shield on the right side of a card. If you see a card with a, a tilde there, that just means it has no armor. You'll see that on most creatures. Some creatures do have armor, though. Uh, Champion Tavris has two armor. Well, armor prevents the first however much damage each turn. So, for example, if uh, Champion Tavris were to fight the Ixilo Bolter, um, she would deal six damage to the Ixilo Bolter. The Ixilo Bolter would deal three damage to her. The armor would prevent two of it, so one damage would be applied to her. Now, if... Uh, something allowed her to become ready and fight another creature. At that point, her armor is has been used that turn, so so she would just take the full damage. As soon as the turn ends, she gets that armor back, um, and it, it refreshes every turn. So armor just prevents the first however much damage each turn. Uh, chains are a game mechanic that causes you to draw fewer cards. So the very basic level that all you probably need to know for your first game, for your first few games, is that if you have 
uh, from one to six chains, then when you get to step five and you would draw six cards in your hand, you draw one less. So if I have three chains, uh, then when I get to step five, I'm going to draw five cards and I'm going to draw two five cards instead of six. So let's say I have four cards in my hand. I get to step five. I'm going to draw one card. I now have five cards. I stop. Uh, and then if I would have drawn more, if I didn't have chains, which is true, right? I, I drew one less because of the chains, then I lose a chain. So now I'll have two chains. At the end of my next turn, I'll draw to five again and drop to one chain. The next turn, I'll draw to five again, lose my last chain. And then the turn after that, I'll draw to six. Now, if you have uh, from seven to 12 chains, then you actually draw two fewer cards. From 13 to 18, it's three fewer cards. And from 19 up to 24, it's four fewer cards. I don't know what happens after that, but I uh, haven't seen it. It hasn't come up. So anyway, uh, but probably, you know, in your first few games, the, the likelihood of you getting more than six chains is really low. So just know if you have chains, you draw one less card and then lose a chain. Okay. All right. Um, here are a few key concepts to understanding how the game works. And some of these are really common to this type of game. Uh, the first is the golden rule. And that says that cards beat rules. So, for example, uh, if I choose Brobnar as my active house, then I can use my Brobnar creatures to reap or fight. But if I play follow the leader, follow the leader says for the remainder of the turn, each friendly creature may fight. Well, the rules say that only creatures from the active house may fight. But follow the leader says each friendly creature may fight. Follow the leader wins and overrides the rule book. And uh, that's just a general principle. When, the, when a card conflicts with the rules, go with the card. The second key idea is, uh, and this is really peculiar to uh, Keyforge, is this idea, resolve as much as you can. And what resolve as much as you can means is that uh, I can, anytime I play a card, um, first of all, I can play a card even if it won't have an effect. Uh, I'm still allowed to play it, and I should do as many things that the card tells me to do as possible. So, for example, uh, I have this card, Pawn Sacrifice. Now, when I play Pawn Sacrifice, I gain an amber because it has that amber bonus, and then it says, sacrifice a friendly creature. If you do, deal three damage each to two creatures. So, what does this mean? First, if I have a friendly creature... I must sacrifice a friendly creature. If I have three friendly creatures, I can choose which one. If I only have one friendly creature, I have to sacrifice it. Now this part, the second part says, if you do. So that means that this only triggers if I sacrifice a friendly creature. But let's say I did. Then deal three damage each to two creatures. Well, what if there's only one creature on the board? Well, I deal three damage to that one creature. And, and then I stop. What if my opponent has one creature and I have one creature? Well, then I have to deal three damage to their creature and three damage to my creature. What if they have only one of, there's only one creature on the board. It's a six power creature that my opponent has. Can I deal three damage to that creature? And then I have to deal the three damage, the second three damage to it? No, because it says to two creatures. So it's three damage each. So that one creature would only get three damage. A uh, similar example, there's a card called Anger that says ready and fight with a friendly creature. Um, let's say I play a Brobnar uh, creature out, it comes out exhausted, and then I, I play Anger, I ready the creature, I fight with it. Uh, if my opponent has a creature, then I can fight, so I do. What if my opponent doesn't have a creature? I can't fight. So uh, what happens? Am I not able to play that card? No, I'm able to play that card. It readies my creature. My creature tries to fight, it can't, so it doesn't. Well, the creature's left ready. That's convenient, because I can reap with it. But uh, in any case, what you're going to do in each of these situations is resolve as much as you can. Uh, just because a later part of the card won't work doesn't mean an earlier part can't be followed. Occasionally, you'll see wording like this, if you do, uh, or as a cost, that changes things a little bit. But that's just very few cards. 
Um, another key concept is that cannot beats must or may. So if there's two cards and one of them, if there's two cards in effect, but one of them says uh, you must do thing X, and another card says you cannot do thing X, the cannot wins and you still cannot do thing X. Um, and then we'll di dive into this a little deeper, but anytime there's a timing conflict or uh, a tie on something, the active player, the player whose turn it is, gets to choose the order. So if a card says to destroy the most powerful creature, and there are three creatures that are tied for most powerful, then whoever's turn it is gets to choose which of those actually is affected. All right, let's talk about timing. Uh, by default, when you see abilities uh, that, that are like this, fight, gain one, for example, um, this says that when Headhunter fights, it gains, it gains you one Amber. Well, by default, uh, all these types of abilities, um, they happen after the triggering event. So in other words, what Headhunter could say, to be a little more clear even, would be after fight, gain one Amber. Um, this is important because it means that Headhunter has to actually survive the fight in order for this to trigger. If he doesn't survive the fight, then he's in the discard pile and his ability isn't around. Um, so, so sometimes this does matter a bit, but uh, in any case, if, if it's not specified otherwise, then these abilities uh, are after the event. Now there are some examples of before. So Fire Spitter is an example where it says before fight. So even if Fire Spitter dies, this will still trigger because it happens before the fight. And there is an additional window that's win. Uh, and Crystal Hive is, is an example of this. It says uh, once you've used it, then for the remainder of the turn, gain one amber each time a creature reaps. Well, that would be, uh, it doesn't say after a creature reaps. It says each time a creature reaps. So that would be a when trigger. So there's those three timing windows, uh, before, when, and after. If two things have a tie for when they should go off, then the active player chooses what order to resolve them in, but uh, but they do both go off. So one example I was talking about with a local player yesterday, uh, earlier today actually, was uh, if you have the card Pingle Who Annoys and your opponent plays the card Urchin, what happens? Pingle, annoys has, Pingle Who Annoys has the text, uh, when an enemy creature, or after an enemy creature enters play, deal one damage to it. And Urchin has the text, play, steal one amber. Well, Pingle's ability, do one damage to the enemy creature, happens after the Urchin enters play. Also, Urchin's steal ability, play, steal, uh, takes effect after it enters play. Well, does it, is it destroyed before it can steal? And uh, first of all, the answer is that the active player, the player whose turn it is, who's playing Urchin, gets to decide which order those things happen in. So they can decide whether the Urchin is destroyed first and then the steal happens, or whether the Urchin steals first and then is destroyed. Um, but it doesn't matter which order because both things will happen. Both things go... Uh, both, both things get read simultaneously. They're both going to take effect. And then the active player just gets to choose which order they happen in. So most of the time it, it actually won't matter. Occasionally it will. And uh, in that case, the active player gets to decide which order to do them. Um, and some abilities don't need to be used. So for example, Soul Snatcher says each time a creature is destroyed, its owner gains one amber. This is always true. This is true when it's not your turn. This is true when it is your turn. This is true when you've chosen Dis as your active house, and it's also true when you chose some other house. Um, it's a constant ability, and you'll see there are quite a few of those in the game. So just, if it doesn't say that there's a particular trigger, then it, it just it just works. Okay. Let's talk about keywords. So uh, these are interesting because you'll find these explained on some cards, but not on others. So in each of these examples on this page, the keyword is explained in the card text, but you'll find some cards that 
uh, omit the longer explanation for the sake of space, so it's good to explain it here. So the first one, uh, and by the way, I think all of these keywords are really related to when creatures fight. Um, that's when they matter. Okay, um, so taunt is an ability that is a keyword ability that says that this creature's neighbors can't be attacked. So if you put Ixilx Dominator next to Pingle Who Annoys, for example, on your battle line, and your opponent wants to attack Pingle Who Annoys, they can't until the Dominator is killed first. They, they, uh, they can't attack Dominator's neighbors. Um, they, they need to destroy the Dominator first to get to its neighbors. Um, the, uh, the, rules, the rule book actually recommends uh, pushing these cards slightly forward on the battle line uh, so that you, you, your opponent and you can both see visually where the taunt is and it's easier to, to keep track. But uh, in any case, taunt says that this creature's neighbors can't be attacked. Uh, elusive um, means that the first time this creature is attacked each turn, no damage is dealt. A lot of people get confused and they think that that means that the attacker will get, will be dealt damage, but the creature with elusive it doesn't take damage. But actually, elusive means that neither of them will take damage. So uh, if uh, if Ixil's Dominator fights Pingle who annoys, uh, neither of them takes damage. But that only applies the first time the creature is attacked. So uh, if you attack it a second time with a different creature or somehow with the same creature then that attack would connect and damage would be dealt, dealt both directions. Skirmish is a keyword that causes uh, the creature with it, when it is doing the attacking, it deals damage, but it doesn't take damage. Now, if it is attacked, it does take damage and it gives damage back. But when it is the one attacking, when the creature with Skirmish is the one initiating the attack, it deals damage, but is not dealt damage in return. It's a really nice ability. Okay, a few more keyword abilities here. Uh, these ones are a lot more obscure. You'll see Taunt, Elusive, and Skirmish quite a bit. Um, these, these ones are a little less common, but um, still good to know. Uh, the first one here is Assault. So Assault means that when this creature attacks, it deals damage before the fight. Uh, this leads to some interesting situations. For example, if Ancient Bear fights a creature, fights Pingle who annoys, for example, um, the two damage from Assault is dealt before the fight, and Elusive only prevents damage during the fight. So, so the two damage from Assault actually would kill Pingle. Um, and then, because Pingle's already dead at that point, it the fight kind of fizzles. Ancient Bear is still exhausted, but doesn't take damage from Pingle. So Assault causes damage to be dealt before the fight when this creature attacks. Hazardous is the opposite. Hazardous uh, deals damage before the fight when the creature is is attacked. Not attacking, but attacked. So if uh, so, <laughs> if Ancient Bear were to fight Briar Groveling, then uh, before the fight, Ancient Bear would deal two, and Briar Grubling would deal five, and they'd both die. Um, kind of funny. They're, I guess, opposites in that sense. Um, and then Poison is a special ability, keyword ability, that uh, causes you to deal, uh, to kill the creature that is being dealt damage, even if only one damage is dealt. So, for example, if Moon, if Moon Cursor were to fight Ancient Bear, uh, even though it only deals one damage to the Ancient Bear, because of Poison, Ancient Bear would be destroyed. And because of Skirmish, Moon Cursor wouldn't take any damage. Now, as like a, a, a counterexample, if Moon Cursor fights Briar Grubling, Briar Grubling deals five damage before the fight, which means Moon Cursor dies and doesn't ever any, even get to deal any damage to Briar Grubling. So interesting interactions there. Uh, but again, these three are less common Taunt, uh, Skirmish, and Elusive are a lot more common. Okay, so let's say you watched uh, this video, you watched the slideshow, you watched Mark and I play, and you're like, this is awesome, I just wanna, I just wanna start playing. How do I do it? Um, well, all you really need to play is a deck for each player. So if you get two decks, 
you're good to go. Um, you do need some tokens to play Keyforge. Um, notably, you need tokens to keep track of Amber. You need tokens to keep track of damage. You need uh, tokens to, to mark creatures as stunned. Um, some people just turn them upside down, but um, I prefer some sort of token because that, dis that, that distinguishes from them being exhausted. Um, you probably won't for a while, but eventually you might need plus one power counters and you need something to act as keys to show that you're forging. Um, so if you have, you know, you can use pennies and nickels and dimes um, to, to represent all these things and that's totally fine. Um, the two player starter set is a really good way to start. It's it's pretty cheap. You, I've seen it for as low as about $20, but I think the MSRP is uh, is 25, which is only five dollars more than getting two decks. The two-player starter set comes with two decks in it, uh, two fully unique decks, and it also comes with a full set of tokens uh, to to represent everything that you need for the game, uh, enough for two people. Um, and it also has poster play mats, which aren't going to feel great to play on, but are pretty decent to start. So um, you know, if if you're like I want to start and I I want to play with my friend or my family member, uh, grabbing a two-player starter set is a great idea. Um, I would just plan on playing a bunch to get the feel of the game. Um, play a bunch with the same deck, swap decks with the other person um, to just get a feel for, for different things and how they work together. Um, the more you play, the, the more you'll sort of get a game sense and start to understand how things fit together. Uh, don't beat yourself up if you make some mistakes in the beginning. If you do go play at a store, I would say, hey, you know, I'm I'm new to this, so, um, you know, if you see me making a mistake, please let me know right away. Um, people are generally pretty kind and happy to help newcomers. Um, playing sealed is a great way to uh, kind of get on more equal footing uh, you're, you're playing against people who are also opening up a new deck and discovering it for the first time, so they have a little less experience advantage. Um, if you, you know, see something in particular that you're like, that's a, that's a set of cards that I would really particularly like to play, people do resell uh, open decks uh, online, so you can go, there's a, a, lot, of, a lot of retailers. Um, Team Covenant has a page where they sell opened decks. Um, uh, you can find a lot of these on eBay. Uh, cool Stuff Inc. has it. I think Miniature Market does. Uh, there's a lot of people in the Facebook group that, that sell decks. So you can find open decks pretty much anywhere if, if there's something specific that you want uh, in terms of combos. So um, of course some are going to be pretty expensive and uh, I don't know. I, I like opening fresh decks. So anyway, uh, that's that's how you get in. Though you really only need the two decks and some change, but there's uh, cool upgrade options if you want. Um, once you feel really comfortable and you want to get involved and start playing with other people, uh, <clears throat> you can find you know local stores that that are running KeyForge events probably in your area. I think you know just playing with friends and family is a is a really great experience. But if you want to start uh, playing with other with strangers and, and make new friends. Um, that's, I think, a, a really great option. Um, so I'll just give you a quick rundown of the types of events that exist. Uh, so if you see a, a sealed event, that means that you're going to show up to the event. You are uh, going to be given a, a new deck. These ones usually include the cost of the deck in the, in the price for entry into the event. So you'll get a sealed deck at the at the beginning of the event. You'll open it up and uh, and have it you know use that for the event. Um, whereas in an Archon event, you're bringing a deck from your collection that you chose. Now the simplest format is what I've seen called solo, which just means you're going to have one deck. You're going to be uh, playing with that. Now I have seen uh, some sealed events that are. Um, like triple sealed, which means that you open three decks and then you choose one of them to play for the event. Um, 
the vault tours have been doing that. It gives you, you know, a little, a little more, uh, a little less susceptibility to susceptibility to getting, a, a, you know, real stinker randomly, uh, and you kind of get to choose something that you want to play. But most sealed events, you're going to get one deck. You're just going to open it and play it. Um, an Archon solo would mean you bring a deck from your collection and you you play it for the for the event. Um, chain bound events uh, are events where where you bring a deck from your collection and you play. Um, but uh, as you as you do this, um, your deck can acquire chains. And so so for example. Um, if I go to a Monday Night Chainbound event here, and there are 16 people that show up, we play four rounds, let's say I go undefeated, well then my deck is going to get four chains on it. And next week when I show up to that same event with the same deck, uh, I'm going to have to start every game with four chains. And let's say it does well again, I lose once but win three times, I get three more chains on it. Well that means that next time I bring this deck to a Chainbound event, it's going to have seven chains on it, and I'm going to start every game with seven chains. So uh, you can see how this sort of pushes people to bring different things and try try more things, or at least if somebody is bringing something that is like a really comparatively strong deck, they um, they get a handicap and aren't able to just completely dominate week after week. So chain bound events are really great. Um, I recently got one of my decks up to 12 chains in, twin, in chain bound. Um, I'm really hoping to, to push up a little bit farther to get it to power level 3, um, but after I got it to 12 chains I looked and, and checked and saw that uh, at the time anyway there were fewer than 100 decks that had gotten to 12 chains, so that, that felt pretty cool. Um, reversal is a really neat format, it's really similar to solo except that um, each time you play against an opponent, you play with the deck that they brought, and they play with the deck that you brought. So it's a really good opportunity to get some value out of out of a really bad deck that you opened by bringing it to the reversal event, and making your opponent play with it. Uh, everybody's playing with terrible decks. It's very silly and and fun. Uh, survival is an archon only uh, reversal. Obviously, is a is an archon only format. Chainbound really is intended to be an archon format. Survival is also uh, an Archon format. Survival is a format where you bring uh, more than one deck and um, each time you lose, the deck that you lost with can't be played with anymore. So let's say it's uh, three deck survival. Um, if you lose with your first deck, you, you lose with deck A. You move on to playing with deck B. If you lose with deck B, you move on to playing with deck C. If you lose with deck C, then you're out of the event. Um, so you just keep playing with the same deck until it loses, and then the winner is the person who uh, still has any decks at the end. Uh, stores in my area have been doing two deck survival tournaments that have been really fun. Uh, triad is a format where you bring three decks, your opponent chooses one of them to ban and says you can't use that one and you uh, must win with the other two decks so um, you play up to three games let's say you have decks a b and c your opponent bans deck c so you now have deck a and b you play with deck a you win you now need to play with deck b let's say you lose with it uh, your opponent moves to their second deck, and you're now you're playing for who wins. But you have to you have to win with both of your decks in order to win at triad uh, with your two that that the opponent didn't ban. Um, adaptive is I think my favorite format. It also is the one that that uh, it can take pretty long for matches. Although I think triad could take a long time too. But adapt adaptive takes a little while, um, but it is uh, definitely the most balanced format in terms of uh, matching up player skill regardless of deck uh, power. Um, in an adaptive format, we play up to three games. In the first game, uh, I play with my deck, you play with your deck. In the second game, you play with my deck and I play with your deck. 
Uh, if the same player won both of those games, then that's it. Match over, they won. Uh, but if the same deck won, if the players each won one game, then uh, the players bid chains for who gets to play with the deck that won both times. So I might say, okay, uh, I'll I'll bid three chains to play my deck, and then you say, well, I'll, I would I would play it for five chains, um, and I say, okay, fine. So then you would play with my deck, and you start the game with five chains. So it's a way of balancing out that third game uh, based on. The, the player's willingness to, to put chains on the deck compared to the other one. Um, and, then, uh, and then in the auction format, this is a... So ad Adaptive can be actually really great with either Sealed or Archon. In an auction format, both players, uh, or all the players... This is, auction is Sealed only. Uh, you could play Archon, but it's really intended for Sealed. Um, let's say you have eight players... The eight players in the group all open their sealed decks. They get a chance to look at them. And then you go through an auction process to decide who gets to play with a particular deck. And so people go around bidding chains. And when everyone passes, then whoever was the highest bidder, they, they get to use that deck. They don't get to bid many other decks. They're going to use that deck for the tournament, but they have to start every game with whatever number of chains they bid. So it's a, it's a way of sort of doing that group, uh, doing the, the chain bidding, but um, in a group setting once at the beginning of the event rather than having to do a best of three every match. Um, so yeah, there's a ton of formats, a ton of ways to play. If that was sounded really daunting to you, don't worry about it. Just you know show up for chain bound and, and I think you'll have a really great time. And then, uh, and then after that, maybe find like a solo event that you're interested in. Um, try out Adaptive sometime. I think that's a really great uh, experience. Auction is probably the most, uh, the hardest to, to wrap your head around from a metagame perspective, but I also think it's super fun. So, um, but uh, definitely don't feel like you have to enjoy all the formats in order to enjoy some of the more straightforward ones. Um, so, so that's a wrap. Um, thanks so much. If you got all the way through this, I hope you enjoyed it and that it helped you, uh, to understand what Keyforge is all about. Um, feel free to drop questions on the video and I'll, I'll try to get back and answer them. If you have questions about the game at some future time, I'll do a video walking through the FAQ, all the rules, clarifications and errata, stuff like that. Um, that have come up but uh yeah for now you know if you if you have questions feel free to uh, ask them on the video and I'll, I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability and maybe even uh, maybe even cite <laughs> real sources um so yeah thanks very much get out there and forge some keys